Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felder. Okay, it's good to see everybody back after a break, and we'll go into program number two for this afternoon, and uh, we're going to continue connecting the dots, and uh, the last half hour was just sort of an interlude. So anyway, for those of you joining us, again, we want to thank you for your prayers, your, uh, your letters, your financial help, everything. And uh, for those of you here in the studio, my, how we appreciate your coming in every month. Now again, uh, we're just going to pick right up where we left off. I, uh, sometimes when I review the programs, I think I waste too much time. So we're going to get right back into it, and uh, we're going to start in Revelation Chapter 19, at the second coming of Christ. Now, if you remember, for the last several programs, we were talking about the tribulation, the horrors of it, and how by the end of the tribulation, all the wrath and vexation of God will have just utterly destroyed planet Earth as we know it. And out of that will come then a renewed Garden of Eden-like planet that will make it ready for the millennium, or the thousand years. So we're going to look at that a little bit now this afternoon. But uh, the millennium begins, of course, with the second coming of Christ. All right, all got it? Matthew 19. Oh, that's by the way, Iris wants me to let our television know we still have some of these Q&A books, and uh, I don't mind advertising them, because they are a blessing. Everybody that gets one just loves our question and answer book. So it's uh, still available. All right, Revelation 19, and we're going to begin at verse 11. Now, before the guys flip the board, remember that this is what we've been talking about for the last, oh, I don't know how many programs, that this parenthetical period of time that we had in our last half hour program is made up of these various doctrines of the Apostle Paul, what he calls the revelation of the mysteries. And so that's why we've left it on the board, so that if you haven't caught them all, you can at least be reminded that these mysteries are only found in Paul's epistles. Nowhere else. And that's why I'm always emphasizing Paul's apostleship. And 90% of Christendom never read. They never look at Paul. I can tell it from our audiences. Why don't we get anything from Paul? Well, Get on your pastor. Tell him to get where the things are really meant for us. But they won't do it. So uh, I'm aware of that. All right, Revelation 19 now then. The second coming is going to be the final event of those seven years of wrath and vexation and will usher in then that thousand-year reign of Christ. Verse 11, <clears throat> And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. In other words, God never does anything out of anger or getting even, no vengeance as such. It's simply the result of man's rejection of his offer of love and mercy and grace. Verse 12, his eyes, speaking of Jesus the Christ at his second coming now, his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped or sprinkled or splattered in blood, and his name is called the Word of God, which, of course, is a perfect fit with John's Gospel, chapter 1. Verse 14, And the armies who were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nation. Now, as I'm reading, I'm thinking. A lot of these things come up I really don't intend to do. But you see, there is a difference of opinion, and I don't mind that. I don't mind if people disagree with me, and on some things, I just sit on the fence. In fact, my answer is getting more and more of people, hey, let's wait till we get there. And we won't have to argue, we'll know. Now, the thing that is coming up more and more is the body of Christ going to return with Christ at his second coming, or will we be eternally set in the heavenlies? Now, of course, there are a large group of people that think that we will be strictly heavenly bound and heavenly abode. 
And yet, you see, when I come to a verse like this, this is why I had to stop. When I come to a verse like this, I have to think that maybe we will be with him at his second coming, even though we may later on go back up into... Because don't forget, when we get into the eternal state, when we get into the power of God in the realm of the Spirit, time means nothing, as I said in the last half hour. So from earth to heaven, how long does it take God? Well, a blink of the eye. In other words, when Jesus went from earth to heaven and he came back, he ascended again to heaven. What was that? A million and a millions and millions of miles that he had to traverse? Well, if it was, he did it instantly. And so never confine yourself once we get into the eternal that, oh, it can't happen. Oh, yes, it can. All right, now here's what made me stop. And I sure didn't plan to do this. Verse 14. The armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now think, who can be the armies in heaven? I think, this is why I'm on the fence, I think this is a reference to the body, not angels. It can't be the Old Testament saints because they're not going to be resurrected until 75 days later, remember? And so here's what puts me in a dilemma. <laughs> On the one hand, yes, I think we're going to be with Christ at his second coming. And I think that we may have something to do with the kingdom. Now, I know this is going to rile a lot of people, but I just tell them, hey, disagree with me lovingly as I'm not setting it concrete. I'm not being obstinate. I'm just saying, now, wait a minute. We've got to think these things through. Come back with me to Romans. And this is another portion that nobody that I read has ever addressed to my satisfaction and again, I'm not going to claim that I've got the answer because a lot of these things are debatable, no doubt about it. We have that freedom, and we will. When we get there, we're going to find out who was right and wrong. All right, but in Romans chapter 8, here's another portion of Scripture that I just can't throw aside and say, no, that doesn't mean us. It means somebody else. No, it means us. Boy, I'm going to get way off schedule, honey. We'll have to go into book 78. <laughs> no, don't worry. Romans 8, verse 18. Now Paul is writing, so he's writing to us, members of the body of Christ. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in or to us. For the earnest expectation of the creation, that is, all the animal kingdom, the birds, and everything on creation, all of creation is waiting for the manifestation of the children of God. Well, now go back up to verse 14, 15, and 16, and let's establish who are the children of God that Paul is talking about. Well, it's us. See? It's us. Verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the children of God. For you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, because we're his child. The Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if we're children of God, then we're heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, so be, if we suffer, that we may also be glorified again. All right, now back down to where we were. So the verse 19, the expectation of all of creation at the end of the tribulation and the horrors of it. What are they waiting for? The manifestation of the children of God. That's us. Well, how else could we be manifested except to be with him at his coming? Now, that's why I have to look at it. See, I right, read on. For the creation was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creation itself shall also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of whom? The children of God. Who are the children of God? The body of Christ. Now, I can't separate that, see? But kind of leave it. <laughs> if you read an article tomorrow that refutes what I'm saying, don't get angry. Just say, well, that's one way of looking at it. But I have, now I have to give you another one. 
if I can find it quickly. I'm thinking all this while I'm talking, you want to remember. Back here in, uh, in Revelation, it's not only here that I have a question, 19, where the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, well, that, that, that can't be anybody, I don't think, except the body of Christ. Now, I'm not going to take time to look for the other one. Like I said, this is all off the cuff anyway. But come back to Revelation 19. At least I want to get people to think. You don't have to agree with me, but think. All right, back to verse uh, 14 in Revelation 19. So the armies which were in heaven, and I just can't see that as angels, and it would have said angels. It can't be the Old Testament saints, because like I said, they're not resurrected until 75 days later, remember. That's Daniel chapter 12, in case you have to look it up. All right. Verse 15. And out of his, that is out of Christ, out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And remember that Hebrews tells us the word of the Lord is a what? A two-edged sword. So we're not talking about a metal sword here. We're talking about the spoken word that will come from the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ at his second coming. And uh, he will rule them, future, in the coming thousand years with a rod of iron. And then coming back to the final days of the tribulation, which we looked at in a previous program, when I feel he will use the hundred pound hailstones, you remember, to crush those millions and millions of people gathered in the valleys of Israel. All right, and then verse 16, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now there's his full title, see? And he's going to set up his kingdom. All right, now then, as a result of the horrors of those closing months of the seven years of tribulation, just come on up to verse 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come. Now these are birds of prey, the vultures and the eagles and what have you. And these birds of prey, come and gather yourselves together to the supper of the great God. Now, do I have to compare scripture? Yes. Come back with me again to... Jeremiah, chapter 25. Yeah, Jeremiah 25. Drop in at verse 31. Because... I sometimes think when I read these verses, people say, well, maybe, but maybe not. No maybe to it. This is what is coming. And uh, I read an article again the other day of all the thousands of nuclear weapons that are just waiting to be exploded. And we're getting closer and closer to it every day, see? All right, now then, by the end of the tribulation, I think they're all going to be used just like a string of firecrackers. And this will be the end result. Verse 31. A noise. Now, I'm in Jeremiah 25. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord hath a controversy with the nations, all of them. Not just Israel now. We're dealing with the whole. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts. See, the same Lord that we're reading about at his second coming. Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation. A great whirlwind shall be raised up from the borders of the earth. And the slain of the Lord by the millions, beloved. Millions, billions are going to be losing their life. And they shall be from one end of the earth even to the other. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They're going to be like dung or roadkill. Everywhere you look, dead bodies. It's going to be awful. All right, now back to Revelation. And you know what? One of the amazing things of the last few years, and I've had more than one person call some of the wildlife people to see if this is true, all around the planet, there's a great increase in the birth rate of these birds of prey. 
The first one I read about, probably 10 years ago, one of the vulture types, I think that was in the Middle East, that normally had two eggs in their nest. We're now having four. And uh, same way here in America. A lot of the species that we call vultures and birds of prey are increasing by leaps and bounds. And of course, they're under protection. Nobody can kill them. And uh, it's all for a reason, see? And now here we have it. Revelation 19. He calls all the birds of prey together that they can come for the supper of the great God. All of this death and destruction. Verse 18, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, of mighty men, the flesh of horses and men that sit on them, the flesh of all men, free and bond, both small and great. And then verse 19, and I saw the beast, that is the Antichrist, and the kings of the earth who have been subjected to his demonic rule and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And of course, we covered that several programs back. But now this is the new part that I hadn't covered before. Verse 20, when the tribulation has run its course and it's over, then those two men who were primary in the leadership of planet Earth, the Antichrist in the political and the economical, and the false prophet who will be the religious leader of that time, two men, and here they come. Verse 20. The beast, the Antichrist, was taken, and with him the false prophet or the religious leader, whoever it is. I'm not going to put a name on either one of them. These men wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them who worshipped his image all during these seven years. Now, both of these men, these both, were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. Now, I know we all shrink at the thought of an eternal hell fire, and nobody wants to even preach it or teach it anymore. In fact, I had a letter just the other day where the guy was angry. What kind of a God is it that would cast people into such a place? I'll tell you what kind of a God he is. He's a God who paid the price for every one of them if they would have believed it. They don't have to go there. And that's going to be one of the awful things of eternal loss. They're going to regret for eternity why they rejected their free pardon out. They don't have to be there. So don't ever blame God for preparing such a place because he suffered far more alone than the billions of mankind will in unison. So don't ever take anything away from God in that department. All right, so these two men, the Antichrist and the false prophet, who had been the leaders of the last seven years, will be the first human beings to go into what we now realize was the eternal lake of fire. All right, now I'm going to take you on over into chapter 20. And uh, the tribulation has ended, and uh, the kingdom is now be ready to be brought in. Verse 1 of chapter 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Not an iron chain. Iron won't hold a spirit being like Satan. But it'll be something that God can use to confine Satan. So he laid his hand on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Now this is the first time in Scripture that we have a time frame on the kingdom. Now, all through the Old Testament, the kingdom is merely promised as being forever and ever, but never is it signified as one thousand years. But here in the book of Revelation, we now have it uh, simply defined as that period of time. All right, reading on. Verse 3. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, not hell, not the lake of fire. This is a separate place that God has prepared to hold Satan for these thousand years. And shuts him up and sets a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more. But what's the next word? Until. See, there's another time word. He's not going to stay there forever yet. He's only be confined for that thousand years of the kingdom rule and reign of Christ. And then, see, and then, or until, 
the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. Now there again, we don't know how long a period of time that will be. After the thousand years of the perfect rule and reign of Christ over planet Earth, it's going to be heaven on Earth for all the inhabitants. But I maintain that the thousand years are a dispensation. Now, I'm going to exercise your thinking now. You remember what a dispensation was? I hope you remember a period of time during which God deals with the human race in a particular way or under a set of instructions. That's a dispensation. Adam and Eve were in a dispensation in the Garden of Eden. Simple. Don't eat of that tree. The next 14, 1500 years, they were under conscience. Well, conscience didn't cut it, so you know what happened. They went through the flood, and then they went through the Tower of Babel. And then God did something totally different. He called out Abraham. And for a period of time, he was under the promises of that dispensation, that God will do this, and God will do that. All right, then after Abraham had established the nation of Israel, and they became a nation down in Egypt in 1500 BC, God brought them out, and he put them under a new dispensation that we call what? Law. And so he gave the dispensation of law. And that carried on from Moses until Paul. And that dispensation had its set of instructions. How to respond to sin and how to uh, keep the law and so on and so forth. It was a dispensation. Period of time during which there was specific instructions. All right, we're in a dispensation of grace. And which covers the mysteries of Paul. But what are our instructions? Believe the gospel. See? Believe the gospel. And once we become a believer of the gospel, how to walk the Christian life. Those are our instructions. It's our dispensation. But when the church goes, that dispensation ends and we go back under an extension of Israel's law. But now we come to the kingdom, it too is a dispensation. It's a period of time during which those people who will be repopulating at an amazing rate, remember. And what's their instructions? Be obedient to the king. That's all. Recognize that he's the king, he's the God of glory, and as long as they're obedient, they're in God's grace. All right. Now, in order to exercise the instructions of a dispensation, you have to have two choices. Think about it. You're either going to follow the instructions or you're going to disobey them. Now, I stop once in a while to make people think. In this dispensation of grace, the world is faced with two alternatives. Believe the gospel or reject it. It's that simple. Believe it and have eternal life. Reject it and go to an eternal doom. Now you can't get it any simpler than that. All right, now in the kingdom, it too is a dispensation where God has given the circumstances that all they have to do is be obedient to the king. But there has been nobody to trigger the opposition. Satan's locked up. So in order for people to have the unction to make a choice, God has to bring Satan back for a period of time. Now, I hope that answers a ton of questions because it comes all the time. Why bring Satan back if he once had him off the scene? He's got to give those new generations of people who have been born during this thousand years the opportunity to be obedient or disobedient. And so when Satan comes back in that period of time, we don't know how long it is. Like I said in the first program, time means nothing to God. It could be a while. But it'll be long enough for those millions upon millions of new inhabitants of planet Earth to be confronted with the options. Remain loyal to the king or follow the adversary. And what will most of them do? Like they've been doing for 6,000 years, they'll go after the adversary. Unbelievable. All right, let's pick it up. Oh, uh, let's see. Let's just jump ahead and then I'll come back and pick up the verse in between. Verse 7. When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. 
and shall go out to deceive. Just like he's been doing through this 6,000 years. He will go out to deceive the nations. See, that's why several programs back I pointed out who comes in at the front end of that thousand years? Well, a remnant of the nation of Israel, who will be the largest of any one nation. But then there will be a sampling of all the other nations on the planet who have survived the tribulation as believers. And they'll come in on the front end and start having families and reproduce. It's going to be just like Israel in Egypt. My land. How, how fast do you think the Jews reproduced in those early years in Egypt? Why like flies, you know? They probably had multiple births. They never lost a child. And you remember what the midwives said? Why those Hebrew women are so lively, there's no way of putting their babies to death before they're born. And it was a population explosion. Well, you're going to have the same thing in the kingdom. This thousand years is going to be a population explosion like the world has never seen. Because there's nothing to refrain life. There's no death, no sickness, no weakness. See? All right, so now then Satan comes back on the scene and he goes out to deceive all these repopulated nations that are around the four quarters of the earth, Gog, Magog, the whole shebang, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is at the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the comp of the saints about the beloved city in total, just like it was a thousand and seven years earl er uh, earlier, they come back in total rebellion against the king with the idea of overthrowing him. But this time God doesn't fool around. He speaks the word and the whole mass of them will be wiped off except those who remain true to the king. All right, now in a quick half a minute, what in the world will Satan use to deceive people who have had heaven on earth for a thousand years? Well, the Bible doesn't specifically say it, but I think it's implied, and I'm comfortable with my opinion. He's going to offer them just like he did Eve in the Garden of Eden. Why be content to be under God? Why don't you just be God? And that's Satan's lie. And uh, it's going to just take all those billions of new people, and they're going to follow after him, and they're going to go to their doom. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.